working? Okay, I think it's working. Okay, so I'm, hi, I'm in charge of, <laughs> I'm in charge of a chapter, I think Teacher Ng already did, okay, um, so we're at book two, we're at book two of Tale of Two Cities, and this is chapter two, so just like what you've been doing with Teacher Ng Ong, every time I say, like, pause here you just continue reading until you reach a certain point okay so just to speed this up so we are at chapter two i know that my my recording is not as cool as teacher ing ang i know he has like a powerpoint and everything um so let's just like base it on that because i don't think i have time to do that sorry so anyway so we will uh, this we are already. I think you ended chapter one with a uh, young Jerry wondering why his dad, his dad, um, fingers were always rusty. So now let's go to chapter two. A sight. You know the old Bailey well, no doubt," said one of the oldest of clerks to Jerry the messenger. "Yes, sir," returned Jerry in something of a dogged manner. "I do know the Bailey, just so, and you know, Mister Lorry." I know Mr. Lorry, sir, much better than I know the Bailey, much better, said Jerry, not unlike a reluctant witness at the establishment in question, than I, as an honest tradesman, wish to know the Bailey. Very well, find the door where the witnesses go in and show the doorkeeper this note for Mr. Lorry. He will then let you in. Into the court, sir? Into the court. So there is already a trial. There's a trial going on. Mr. Cruncher's eyes seemed to get a little closer to one another and to interchange the inquiry. What do you think of this? Am I to wait the court, sir? He asked, as a result of that conference. I am going to tell you. The doorkeeper will pass the note to Mr. Lorry, and do you make any gesture that will attract Mr. Lorry's attention and show him where you stand? Then what you have to do is to remain there until he wants you. So he has a message to deliver to Mr. Lorry, who is in the court okay so we have here wait can i make this full screen anyway okay so that's all he wishes to have a messenger at hand this is to tell him you are there as the ancient clerk deliberately folded and superscribed the note mr cruncher after surveying him in silence until he came to the blotting paper stage remarked I suppose they'll be trying forgeries this morning. Treason. That's quartering, said Jerry. Barbarous. It is the law, remarked the ancient clerk, turning his surprise spectacles upon him. It is the law. It's hard in the law to spile a man, I think. It's hard enough to kill him, but it's very hard to spile him, sir. It is hard in the law to spile... I just read the same thing twice. Okay, wait. Not at all, retain the ancient clerk. Speak well of the law, take care of your chest and voice, my good friend, and leave the law to take care of itself. I give you that advice. It's the damp, sir, what settles my chest and voice, said Jerry. I leave you to judge what a damp way of earning is living mine is. Earning a living mine is. Well, well, said the old clerk. We have we all have our various ways of gaining a livelihood. Some of us have damp ways and some of us have dry ways. Here is a letter go along. Jerry took the letter and remarking to himself with less internal deference than he made an outward show of. You are a lean old one too. I <laughs> made his bow, informed his son in passing of his destination and went his way. Now pause. I'll, uh, you can pause here and then you read all the way to um, after some delay. Okay, so when you reach the paragraph that says after some delay, uh, you can unpause. Okay, pause. And pause. After some delay and dimmer, the door grudgingly turned on its hinges a very little way and allowed Mr. Jerry Cruncher to squeeze himself into court. So now he is already in court. What's on, he asked in a whisper of the man he found himself next to. Nothing yet. What's coming on? A treason case. The quartering one, eh? Uh, quartering is when you tie when you tie the both arms and both legs and to horses or whatever and then the horses tear you apart into four that is what quartering is so this 
case, the the penalty for this case if found guilty is quartering, which is pretty, it's pretty intense. Okay. Okay. Ah, returned the man with relish. He'll be drawn on a hurdle to be half hanged and he'll be taken down and sliced before his own face. And then he is inside will be taken out and burnt while he looks on. My gosh. And then his head will be chopped off and he'll be cut into quarters. That's the sentence. If he's found guilty, you mean to say? Jerry added by way of proviso. Oh, they'll find him guilty, said the other. Don't you be afraid of that. Mr. Cruncher's attention was here diverted to the doorkeeper, whom he saw making his way to Mr. Lorry with a note in his hand. Mr. Lorry sat at the table among the gentlemen in wigs, not far from a wig gentleman, the prisoner's counsel, who had a great bundle of papers before him. And nearly opposite another wig gentleman, with his hand in his pocket, whose whole attention, when Mr. Cruncher looked at him, then or afterwards, seemed to be concentrated on the feeling of the court. After some gruff coughing and rubbing of his chin and signing with his hand, Jerry attracted the notice of Mr. Lorry, who had stood up to look for him and who quietly nodded and sat down again. So, the scene was there were three gentlemen. One was busy with papers. One was Mr. Lorry. And then the other one was this guy, who is my bae forever. Did Ingong show you the... I think Ingong showed you the characters already. Man. This guy is my favorite, okay? He was staring at the ceiling and not saying anything, but uh, both of the, all of them were wigged. Okay. What's he got to do with the case? Asked the man he had spoken with. Blessed if I know, said Jerry. What have you got to do with it then? If a person may inquire. Blessed if I know that either, said Jerry. The entrance of the judge and a consequent great stir and settling down in the court stopped the dialogue. Presently, the dock became the central point of interest. Two bowlers who had been standing there went out and the prisoner was brought in and put to the bar. Everybody present except the one wig gentleman who looked at the ceiling stared at him. All the human breath in the place rolled at him like sea or a wind or a fire. Eager faces strained round pillars and corners to get a sight of him. Spectators in back rows stood up not to miss a hair of him. People on the floor of the court laid their hands on the shoulders of the people before them to help themselves at anybody's cost to a view of him. Stood at tiptoe, got upon ledges, stood upon next to nothing to see every inch of him. Conspicuous among these latter, like an animated bit of the spiked wall of Newgate, Jerry stood, aiming at the prisoner of beery breath of a wet he had taken as he came along and discharging it to a mingle in the waves of the beer and gin and tea and coffee and whatnot that flowed at him and already broke up the great windows behind him in an impure mist and rain. Everybody looked at him. Everyone. So everybody was like preening and like everybody just wanted to get a glimpse of the witness, the one that, oh no, the man on trial. The object of all this staring and blaring was a young man of about five and twenty, well-grown and well-looking, with a sunburned cheek and a dark eye. His condition was that of a young gentleman. He was plainly dressed in black or very dark gray, and his hair, which was long and dark, was gathered in a ribbon at the back of his neck, like in Assassin's Creed, more to be out of his way than for ornament. As an emotion of the mind will express itself through any covering of the body, so the paleness which his situation engendered came through the brown upon his cheek, showing the soul to be stronger than the sun. He was otherwise quite self-possessed, bowed to the judge, and stood quiet. So he was a very handsome man. He was not, he did not show any cowardice or anything like that. And he was calm and he looked very strong. Okay, now, pause. Okay, so... Uh, while we are in uh, the sort of interest, uh, can you read that all the way to... Um, uh, okay, pause and then you stop. You unpause when you read the paragraph that begins with, It happened. It happened that the action turned his face. Okay, pause. Okay, so as you can see... Um, Charles Darnay was Charles Darnay was very 
um, a subject of much interest with all these people. And then, um, what do you call this? Everybody was looking at him. He showed such reservation and all of that. And while he was standing in the middle of the court with that mirror, did you get that? That the mirror was there and it was like reflecting light across his face. While that happened, Dipa, he turned. And then when he turned, everybody turned to the direction where he turned because he was looking at two people now. Uh, let's continue. It happened that the action turned his face to that side of the court, which was on his left. About on a level with his eye, there sat, in that corner of the judge's bench, two persons upon whom his look immediately rested, so immediately and so much to the changing of his aspect, that all the eyes that were turned upon him turned to them. The spectators saw, in the two figures, a young lady, a little more than twenty, and a gentleman who was evidently her father, a man of a very remarkable appearance in respect of the absolute whiteness of his hair and a certain indescribable intensity of face, not of an active kind, but pondering and self-communing. When this expression was upon him, he looked as if he were old, but when it was stirred and broken up, as it was now, in a moment, on his speaking to his daughter, he became a handsome man, not past the prime of life. His daughter had one of her hands drawn through his arm as she sat by him, and the other pressed upon it. She had drawn close to him in her dread of the scene and in her pity for the prisoner. So, obviously, these are the manettes. So, it's, it's very interesting that um, he was said, uh, she, Lucy, was said to have been looking at Darnay with pity. So, she was like, and she was, she was there like, as a friend to him. Her forehead had been strikingly expressive of an engrossing terror and compassion that saw nothing but the peril of the accused. This had been so very noticeable, so very powerfully and naturally shown, that starers who had had no pity for him were touched by her, that the whisper went about, who are they? So people who were there watching the trial because they wanted to see what would happen to Charles Darnay and they were kind of imagine, imagining him quartered and all that when they saw Lucy's expression that she was looking at Darnay and obviously she had a lot of pity for him in her eyes and her forehead her I don't know why she got any young forehead but uh, when they saw that expression on her face they immediately felt sorry Mer those those murderous brutal thoughts of of Darnay getting quartered all of a sudden hushed because they saw her expression Jerry, the messenger who had made his own observations in his own manner and who had been sucking the rest of his fingers in his absorption, stretched his neck to hear who they were. The crowd about him had pressed and passed the inquiry on the nearest attendant, and from him it had been more slowly pressed and passed back. At last it got to Jerry. Witnesses. For which side? Against. Against which side? The prisoner. So... The Manettes were there against um, Darnay. They were not there for Darnay. They were there against Darnay. But then, which was a very ironic thing, because Lucy was was mentioned to have been looking at him in a very kind of like looey way. The judge, whose eyes had gone in the general direction, recalled them, leaned back in his seat, and looked steadily at the man whose life was in his hand. As Mr. Attorney General rose to spin the rope, grind the axe, and hammer the nails, into the scaffold. Hello, dun dun dun. So, a trial na si Charles Darnay and I teacher Ing Ong is in charge of all the odd odd numbers, odd chapters. So, he will be reading the disappointment and I will see you again for chapter 4.